Hi gang, in this video I'm going to show you how to analyze the forces associated with a lifting task such as performing a barbell squat or bench press. To begin, let's assume that we've collected time and position data via a motion capture system. In this particular video we're going to look at two scenarios. I'm going to have my time in column D and my position data for the first scenario in column E where I'm going to have the position data for my second scenario in column I. Now the first thing we're going to need to do is calculate out the velocity and the acceleration data. You've already learned how to do that in previous videos, so I'm not going to repeat that here. But let's go ahead and take a look at our position as a function of time. And you can see that we're going to start at a zero position and we're going to raise up to a position of length 1. Then you can look at our velocity data and you can see that we're going to start with a zero velocity and we're going to end with a zero velocity. And then finally here you can look at our acceleration graphs and you can see by visual inspection that the area under the positive curve and the area under the negative curve are going to be equal. But we already know how to do that. So what we want to do next is we want to be able to analyze the forces that are associated with these lifts. So first, in a separate tab, I've created a free body diagram showing all the forces that are going to be associated with the barbell. I've then listed my relevant equations over here in column H. The first relevant equation is going to be the force due to gravity, so let's calculate that. So I return to my lifting data, and I'm going to create in column M here my force due to gravity. Again, this is going to be in the y direction, and this is going to be in newtons. And I like to just clean things up a little bit in terms of my fonts. Now recall that the force due to gravity is going to be equal to the mass times the acceleration due to gravity. So here that's going to be equal to my mass, which I have in this column right here, and then I'm going to pin it, multiplied by the acceleration due to gravity, and again I'm going to pin it, I'm going to hit enter, and I'm going to take this all the way down. Next, I need to determine the effective force in the y direction. The effective force in the y direction is equal to the mass times the acceleration in the y direction. So here I want to know the effective force for scenario 1. And again, that's going to be in newtons. And again, I just like to clean things up a little bit. And we said that this was going to be equal to the mass. And I'm going to want to pin that. And then I'm going to multiply that by the acceleration in the y direction for scenario 1, which we've previously calculated. And because that value is going to be changing, I do not want to pin that value. I take this and I'm going to bring it all the way down. And there I have my effective force in the y direction. 
Turning back to my equations, I then wanted to determine the inertial force in the y direction. And the normal force in the y direction is simply going to be the effective force times a negative 1. And again, this is going to be in Newtons. I'm going to take this and I'm just going to clean things up a little bit. And we said that this is going to be equal to negative 1 times the effective force. And I can bring this all the way down. Next, I need to determine the force that your body needs to produce on the barbell. Well, we know the force produced by your body on the barbell, plus the force due to gravity, plus the inertial force is going to be equal to zero. Therefore, we know that the force your body needs to produce on the barbell is going to be equal to a negative one times the force due to gravity, plus the inertial force. So I return back to my data. So now I'm going to determine the force of the body for scenario one. And again, I'm just going to clean this up a little bit. It's going to be equal to a negative one times the force due to gravity plus the inertial force. And I'm going to take that and I'm going to bring it all the way down. Next, I'm going to determine the power of the force that your body is producing on the barbell. And the power that the force of your body is producing on the barbell is going to be equal to the force that your body is producing on the barbell times the velocity of the barbell. So if I look at power times the force body one, and again, I'm just going to clean this up a little bit. It's going to be equal to the force of body one times the velocity for our first scenario. I'll highlight that real quick so you can see it. And then again, I'm going to drag that all the way down. Finally, I want to determine the work of the force of body one. And we're going to have to then find the area under the power time curve. But well, we're just going to use the same algorithm we always use to find the area under a curve. We're going to assume our initial condition for the work is going to be zero. And then we're going to determine the area under the power time curve as being the average of these power values here times our change in time. And then we have to add back in our 
previous work. And again, I'll highlight this for a sec so you can take a look at what we did. And then I'm going to take this and I'm going to drag it all the way down. So now we've determined all the kinetics associated with the first scenario. Next, let's take a look at their graphs. I'm not going to spend time in this video repeating how to show you how to graph. I'm just going to do it and then we will continue. All right, now let's take a look at some of the graphs that we produced. Let's take a look at the relevant forces associated with scenario one. You'll see here first we have the force due to gravity, and that is going to be a negative constant, which is going to be proportional to the mass of the barbell. Next, we can look at the effective force, and the effective force here we see first is initially going to be positive, and then is going to be negative. How do we associate that? Well, if we go back and we look at the acceleration, remember the acceleration is first going to be positive and then it's going to be negative. And since the effective force is the mass times the acceleration, and since the mass is a scalar, then the effective force curve should follow the same shape as the acceleration curve. It's just going to be a different proportionality related to the mass. Next, let's take a look at the inertial force. The inertial force is the same magnitude but the opposite direction of the effective force. And you can see here with our gray line, it is going to be equal in magnitude and opposite in direction of our blue line or our effective force. Finally, let's take a look at the force your body has to produce in order to make these forces happen. Well, if you look here, F body here in gold is going to follow the same general shape as our effective force is here in blue but it's going to be shifted up from the zero line by an amount that's going to be equal in magnitude and opposite in direction of the force due to gravity. So again, we're just going to take this whole effective force curve here, and we're just going to shift it up by the same magnitude that we have for our force due to gravity. Okay, now let's take a look at the power that the force of body one is producing. And again, the power is going to start at zero, and it's going to end at zero, and we're going to have a peak up here somewhere around the middle. Also note that the power is always positive. That means that the force that your body is producing is going to be generating energy. And in this case, the force of your body in scenario one is going to be increasing both the kinetic as well as potential energy of the body. Now let's take a look at the work that's being done by the force that your body is producing in scenario one. And you'll see that it's going to go from zero up to some value up here when it finishes. Now let's see what this value up here when we finish is, and let's see if we can use that in order to check our work. So I'm going to return back here to my data, and I need to know a couple of values. First, I'm going to need to know the average value of the force of body one. And I'm going to say that this is going to be equal to the average of the force of body one. Next, I'm going to need to know the total displacement. And again, right here, I'm just kind of cleaning things up a little bit. And I'm going to say that this is going to be equal to my final position minus my initial position. Now I can determine the work that's going to be performed by the average force of body one. And that's simply going to be equal to the force multiplied by the displacement. Now 
Now I already determined the work by method one, and that's going to be equal to this final value here in S3 minus the initial value in my S column. And I don't even need to do the calculation, but let's just determine the difference between the two methods. And we see that that's a, essentially a zero number here, which gives me some confidence that I've done the work correctly. Now, a few other things that I would like to point out. First, what does this value here actually represent? Well, in this case here, the force of body one is changing both the potential as well as the kinetic energy of that barbell. Well, let's determine what the change in potential energy of that barbell was. So that change in potential energy is going to be equal to the mass times the acceleration due to gravity, times the initial position, minus the mass, times the acceleration due to gravity, times my final position, And we see here that the total change in potential energy is equal to the work that's done by the force of body one. Now, what about the kinetic energy? Well, let's go back to our velocity graph here for a second. In our velocity graph, we see that we start with zero velocity and then we end with zero velocity. That means we have a starting kinetic energy of zero and we have an ending kinetic energy of zero. So if my kinetic energy starts with zero and it ends with zero, my overall change in kinetic energy is going to be zero. And that's why it's not going to be reflected in my work values here. Okay, now that we have scenario one figured out, I went ahead and I repeated the process for scenario two. And I've determined the effective force, the inertial force, the force your body has to exert on the barbell, the power of the force that your body is exerting on the barbell, and the work of the force that your body is exerting on the barbell. So I'm not gonna show you all the steps here because it's simply just repeating the steps that we did before. But let's go ahead and take a look at some graphs. If we look at the graph of the forces that your body is exerting on the barbell, we will see that because we had the same displacement between the two scenarios, but the second scenario was performed a lot more quickly than the first, that we're gonna to have to have larger forces due to the larger inertial forces. Those larger forces over a shorter period of time, those larger forces over a shorter period of time would also mean that we are going to have a larger peak power than we see with the slower movement speed. Yet finally, if we look at the work between the two conditions here, we'll see the work is going to end up being the same. Why is the work the same? Because again, if our initial velocity is zero and our final velocity is zero, our initial kinetic energy is zero and our final kinetic energy is zero, which means our change in kinetic energy is zero, and the work, the force that your body is producing on the barbell is only going to correspond to the change in potential energy. And since the barbell displaced the same for both scenarios, that means that the change in potential energy is going to be the same for both scenarios. But because in scenario two, that work was performed more quickly, you'll see that we are going to have a steeper slope on the work time curve, and that corresponds to the larger power. And there you have it. That's how we're going to analyze the forces for this class.